Today we're going to talk again about supervised machine learning, particularly classification. And while thus far we've talked about classification in general, now that we have had a chance to see a number of examples of what classification looks like, today we're going to take a look at the big picture. Why are we doing classification? What are the kinds of tasks that classification can be applied to? And how do we know if classification is working well? And in general, how do we set up a good classification pipeline when we don't have the kinds of things that you get in a classroom, like predefined labels? We've been talking about classification as a general purpose tool. And there are a number of research papers out there that you can see that use classification, but they all have different features. And often, when we've talked about classification thus far, we've assumed that the features are already known. And that isn't the case. When you're actually doing classification in the real world, you need to decide what the features are. And not only that, many times you also need to figure out where do the labels come from? How do you get the data? And then how do you know if you've done a good job of classification if you're doing this classification task for the very first time? Classification is not always easy. We've talked about a number of different examples, but here's a difficult example of sentiment analysis where you need to look at, say, an Amazon review and decide, is this talking about the product in a positive way or a negative way? There are a number of things in this review that look like it could be a positive review, but in general, it's a relatively negative review. It's not talking about the positive qualities that you typically associate with coffee machines. And the challenge here is to figure out features that can capture the kind of nuance that we often see in human language. And we've talked about a number of other classification tasks, like deciding whether an email is spam or not. Other examples of classification tasks are taking a look at a visit to a hospital and assigning what kind of medical billing code should it receive. In the United States, medical billing codes basically determine how the healthcare system works, both in the private and the public market. And assigning these codes is very time consuming and a huge part of what the US budget is spent on. Let's say that someone submits an essay exam to TOEFL or to the SAT or to the GRE. What grade should that person get? This is a hugely important task for which people are using classification tools. Let's say that you have a new research paper. Should Google Scholar show it to you because it would be interesting to you? This again is a classification task. Similarly, when calls come into an help desk or when news appears on the web, how should it be filtered? Should it be shown to a person? What category should it receive? All of these are classification tasks. And in general, you can think about any sort of filing system as a classification task that hasn't yet been automated. This is a huge task in many offices. Many people are spending many hours doing this. Often businesses want to automate these tasks and you as a natural language processing engineer or a machine learning engineer will be called upon to automate these human processes of a assigning labels to documents. Thus far, we've talked about measuring classification purely in terms of accuracy. And that doesn't completely tell the picture. And so there are a couple of ways you can describe how your system is working. And so we will separate out the positive examples from the negative examples, both in terms of what your system is saying so that's the test. Also, what the underlying truth is, what the actual labels are. And so these are this column here and this column here. And so the good stuff is on the diagonal. So documents that are positive and you say that they're positive, or documents that are negative and you say that they're negative. So you want as much stuff in here as well. The off-diagonal terms are the bad stuff. And here are the kinds of mistakes that you can make. You can say that a negative document is actually true, or that a positive document is false. Both of these are mistakes, but we differentiate them. And so we call 
negative documents that are described to be true type 1 errors, and true documents that are described to be false as type 2 errors. One way of remembering this is to think about the folk tale of the boy who cried wolf. So in the boy who cried wolf, a boy was charged with protecting the village from wolves and was said to first scream, there's a wolf, there's a wolf, there's a wolf, to get attention from the villagers. The villagers came out, tried to chase the wolf away, and that is a type 1 error. There was no wolf, but he said that there was. Then the next night, he again cried that there was a wolf, there was a wolf, there was a wolf, but there was no wolf. The villagers came out, and then on the third night, he screamed, there's a wolf, there's a wolf, there's a wolf, but there actually was a wolf this time, and he was eaten. And so in this story, the villagers commit type 1 and type 2 errors in that order. The villagers first come out when there is no wolf, and that's a type 1 error. Then they fail to come out when there is a wolf on the third night, and the boy is eaten. So that's a type 2 error. Another way of comparing the effectiveness of classifiers is to look at precision versus recall. And precision is measured as of what you said was relevant or applicable, how much was right. So out of all of the things that you returned as being relevant, how much was correct? And recall is of what could be correct, how much did you find? And these are able to be gained in the extremes. And so if you want to maximize recall, you can just say everything is relevant. Everything is spam. And so then you will always find all of the spam because you simply have all of the documents. But you'll have low precision because of the stuff that you returned, only the things that are actually relevant qualify. And you can also optimize precision by just selecting one document to be relevant, so only say that one document is true, and just be very certain that that document is correct. And oftentimes, classifiers have a threshold that you can set. What probability in logistic regression do you consider to be true versus false? Typically, we set it as 0.5, but you can set it differently. And this is true for other sorts of classification algorithms. And so you can have a frontier that describes the different kinds of trade-offs you can make between precision and recall. And so the more documents that you return, the higher your recall will be, but your precision will likely go down. So let's take a look at this frontier in a little bit more detail. So ideally, you want to be here at the upper right corner. And so here you're not really trading off precision versus recall. You're always going to do great. But in reality, that probably won't happen. You'll have a classifier that has some trade-offs that you have to decide between. So here, what you have is good, but you don't actually find very much stuff. And this is probably good for things like search engines, because you're only looking for a small number of examples. Maybe you only just want one example. This is also good for things like binge watching on Netflix. You only want to find the best movie to watch next, and you don't really care if the top 100 results are all good. Here, you have much better recall, and this is probably good for spam filtering and legal search. It's okay if a couple of bad apples get through, but you want to make sure you're finding all of the relevant documents that you possibly can. Now let's talk about some of the different kinds of computational linguistics tasks that you can apply classification to. For example, words have different senses. So plant could refer to either a living organism or to a manufacturing facility. Have a machine decide which kind of thing that you're talking about. Another example, you have words that lack the accents in the original language. And so here, what you need to do is take a unaccented word and decide which of the possible accented versions of the words 
a form of word census ambiguation that is actually fairly common because of people not having access to full keyboards or people applying improper pre-processing techniques that inadvertently filter out important information that allows you to understand non-English languages when written. Another form of classification that we'll talk a lot about in the coming weeks is part of speech identification. So here you have a context like John saw the saw and decided to take it to the table, and you need to decide what part of speech saw has. And you can see that saw can either be a verb or a noun. And so here in this context, we'll call it a noun by looking at the words around it. For supervised classification, we've always assumed that our data are already available, but that isn't always the case. Often, when you're out in the real world and you have a job, you need to make your own data. And the process of making labeled data from unlabeled data is called annotation. And so all of the previous examples where we had classification examples and we need to apply a label are a form of annotation. Someone said, this word sense applies in this context. This part of speech applies in this context. So where do we get those annotations? And why do we do it? Let's first talk about the why. We manually annotate text for several reasons. One, we want to understand the nature of the text. And so this is often done by social scientists. For example, we want to know what percent of sentences in news articles are opinions. This is an interesting sociological question. They'll devise a way to label this, and that may be their own result, just to report what percentage of sentences in news articles are opinions. But then computational linguistics may come in and say, we want to apply the same analysis to not just hundreds of articles, but millions. So we'll use the hard work that you did to generate this initial set and expand that out to a much larger data set. We may also want to understand the level of human performance. So for part of speech tags, how well can human assign part of speech tags to words? Or we want to evaluate a computer model. So this is probably the thing that you are most familiar with. How often does my algorithm, my tagger, my parser find the correct answer? And for that, we need to have some gold label to know how well we're doing. And as we're building that gold label, we can also use that same process to generate training data. As you develop annotations, what you need to do is you first need to develop a set of annotations, then have annotators annotate the same data, see if they agree, and if they don't, you often need to go back to step one, defining a set of annotations. You often don't have the correct set of labels the first time around. You have defined things poorly, you've forgotten a class, you have created a class that is hard to distinguish between each other. The way that you know that you screwed up when you define that initial set of labels is knowing later whether annotators can actually go out and consistently assign those labels. If your labelers cannot agree on how to label data, that means something has gone wrong. Either your definition of the annotations are wrong, your annotators aren't doing a good job, or your data aren't what you thought they were going to be. And all of these are problems, and you need to fix them until your annotators can agree with you. We've been talking about annotators generally. Who is actually doing the annotation? For many years, it was mostly undergrads and grad students who would pay them an hourly rate and you would have them annotate data. Or if this were a company, you would hire people off the street, pay them an hourly rate to assign the data. A big thing that is now coming into vogue is using crowdsource workers. So you have marketplaces like Figure 8, Amazon Mechanical Turk, things like that, where people can come in and say, I will work for a small amount of money. These are board office workers, people stuck at home for whatever reason. And one of the nice things is they're all around the world. But one of the downside is, because you can't look these crowd workers in the eye, sometimes they do things like create scripts to automatically answer questions, or provide answers in bad faith without putting forth full effort. Thus, as someone creating crowdsourcing tasks, you need to have mechanisms in place to detect this kind of behavior and prevent it. In addition to fairness from your perspective, 
there are also fairness issues in the other direction. And because they're scattered around the world, there isn't a standard global minimum wage, and some people will work for far less money than others. And there are ethical concerns about choosing wages so that you are acting as a good global citizen. Another way of getting annotations is what's called natural annotations, where people often annotate data as a part of interacting with it. And so people review movies and products and give them a number of stars. People look at blogs and categorize them. People assign metadata as a part of reading their email. And these labels are often very useful, but they're often very noisy because they're not done through a formal annotation process where you're trying to achieve high annotator agreement. Let's go back to why it's important to have agreement. Think about what happens when a classifier has inconsistent data. So you have the same data in different annotations. This is perhaps most obvious for a support vector machine. If you have the same data with different annotations, there's no separating hyperplane. You have the same point with the same label. And so there's no way to build a margin between those two data points. And thus, your classifier is only as good as the data that it gets. If your annotators only agree on 40% of the data, the accuracy of the resulting model will be less than 40%. A common problem that I see over and over again as people rush to get data out the door is that you don't detect this disagreement because you only annotate each example once. And people assume that all of these annotations are perfect, but the underlying definition, the underlying labels have some intrinsic problem, or the annotator pool has some intrinsic problem, or the data has some problem. And you won't find out that that problem exists because you are blaming the algorithm. And you assume that all of the data are perfect, and thus the problem must be with our machine learning algorithm. But no, machine learning algorithms work when you have good inputs. And people learn how to do machine learning and computational linguistics on these very carefully created data sets that actually work. But you, when you go out into the real world and you try to create your own data set, it's not going to work as well as these carefully curated data sets made by people who know what they're doing. And if you go out and try to create your own labeling task, you're going to have a bad time. And so you need to make sure that your data sets have high agreement and actually are doing what you think you're doing. So what does it mean to have agreement? So a simple answer is how often do two annotators agree on the same answer? But you should actually do something a little bit more sophisticated, particularly when you have an unbalanced set of labels. And so for things like spam classification, you could have annotators that disagree a lot, but because there's so much more spam than any other kind of email, it may look like they're agreeing just because there's so much more spam. One way that you should compute agreement is compute the probability of coders agreeing, but also compute the probability of coders agreeing by chance. The actual agreement, and then also the agreement that you would expect just chose randomly. So for example, let's say that you have two annotators, A and B, and when annotator B says yes, annotator A says yes 20 times, when annotator B says no, annotator A says yes five times. And when annotator B says yes, annotator A says no 10 times. And then the final class is 15. And so ideally, you want everything on the diagonal. But you can also tell that there are far more yeses than nos. And so how do you compute the chance corrected agreement? So we want things on the diagonal. That's the agreement. And so the probability of agreement, examples, they agree 35 times. So that's 0.7 agreement. But by chance, the probability that both of them says yes, assuming independence, is 0.3. The probability that both say no is 0.2. This just comes from multiplying their marginal probabilities for saying yes and also their marginal probabilities for saying no. Marginal probability for A saying yes is 0.5. The marginal probability for B saying yes is 0.6.
you multiply them together, you get 0.3. You take the complement of that to get the probability of saying no, 0.5 times 0.4, that's 0.2. And so 0.2 for them saying no together, 0.3 for them saying yes together. Typically, you want to have around 0.7 agreement. So this isn't a very good set of annotators here. Something is wrong, either with the definition or with the annotators in general. And we'll see many others, particularly using deep learning, but it's important to keep in mind while we're talking about these algorithms at a high level, why we're doing it. We want to be able to recreate labels on some held out set. And these labels cannot be recreated unless the underlying data makes sense. So keep in mind, whenever you're thinking about classification algorithms, whether your data makes sense. And one thing that often comes up when you're working with deep learning algorithms is that you get disconnected from the data. That these algorithms are so complicated and the algorithms are not very interpretable and things aren't working and you don't really know why. It could just be that your data stink. And you need to keep that in mind as a possibility, particularly when you're trying to do something new. One thing that I often recommend to people is to go to a simpler algorithm, something like logistic regression. Try to create features that make sense and understand what the data are doing. And if you have access to the annotators, try to figure out if the problem is actually there. And even though we're going to talk a lot about deep learning in this class, when you look at arguments about what algorithm works best, these arguments are always conditioned on the data that you have. And better data always wins. And so you can have a really simple algorithm with fantastic data and beat a really complicated algorithm on mediocre data any day of the week. If you're ever forced to choose between algorithm and data, you should choose data. And the reason that the big companies are flocking to deep learning algorithms is not that they have to choose. They've always had the best data. And because they have such rich data, they're able to take advantage of these deep learning algorithms that always work. And if you're not at a Google or a Microsoft or a Facebook or an Amazon, your focus may be more on the data because you don't have as much free data coming to you. And so you need to understand the data well enough to use it effectively. And next we'll talk about how we can use feature engineering to improve our classification performance on specific data sets. And while feature engineering is less important now that deep learning is in vogue, it does help you understand what the data are doing and helps you understand the kinds of phenomena that are actually in your data. And this will help you have a better idea of what your data are about and maybe you can correct or improve underlying problems in your data.